Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now this is the Intel Core i5-10400F and well, I really like it. There, I said it. At the moment, it costs less than the Ryzen 5 3600 here in the UK, though it's often overshadowed by said chip as it can't be overclocked and can't make use of faster DDR4 memory on cheaper B and H series motherboards, the very boards that it should be paired with. You could stick it in a high-end Z series motherboard and enjoy the performance benefits that plus 3000 MHz RAM offers, but I can't justify that recommendation based on cost. Instead of drawing constant comparisons between this and the Ryzen 5, I decided to focus more on what I like about this chip and why you might still want to consider it. This is my review. Firstly, I like the bundled cooler. Now it's not a popular opinion and I know it doesn't look like it could keep an ice cube cool on a cold day, but it is pleasantly surprising. It's near silent at idle operation and remains inaudible under normal usage. The i5 itself sat at 25 degrees under this cooler with the included thermal paste and hit a maximum of 68 degrees under load during my testing, which of course increases fan noise levels to a noticeable but not unbearable level. Jumping into Cinebench R20 and the i5 scored just shy of 3000 points with 16GB of dual channel 2666MHz DDR4. In real world applications this translates to a decent experience in processor intensive tasks such as editing and exporting video projects in Premiere Pro. Gaming is where the i5-10400 really shines, sorry the i5-10400F. I have it paired with my usual EVGA GTX 1080 Ti Founders card, and as you would expect, 1080p 60fps gaming is no trouble for this setup. The 6 cores and 12 threads mean that you shouldn't run into any instances whereby the processor causes a bottleneck though, your overall experience will depend on the graphics card and RAM that you decide to use. Let's start with Call of Duty Modern Warfare Warzone here. The footage was taken from a bot match, but the performance figures, including the average and 1% lows, were taken from online play. In Call of Duty Modern Warfare, with the high settings at 1080p, we saw 153 frames per second with a 1% low of 109 and a 0.1% low of 82. These figures are rounded up from the exact results just to make things easier. The game looks great at these settings and performs very well and the decent 1.1% lows mean that you shouldn't really have any issues with stutter during gameplay, something that is always nice to avoid during online competitive games such as this. Now moving on to the newly released Crisis Remastered and again at 1080p high we were seeing 90 frames per second on average with a 1% low of 27 and a 0.1% low of 23. Now 1.1% lows like this often occur no matter what hardware I'm testing, it's just the way that Crysis utilises or I should say doesn't utilise hardware, especially when it comes to CPUs. The game performs fine but you will notice a few dips here and there, not just with the i5 but with other components whether it be processors or graphics cards. Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p with the high settings also performs very well with 96 frames per second, followed by 1 and 0.1% lows of 77 and 68 respectively. Now these 1 and 0.1% lows again mean that you should experience no real issues during your gameplay here, and at the high settings the game looks fantastic. Now when I say the high settings, I had MSAA turned off, TAA was turned on, FXAA was on, and pretty much all of the options were set to high. I feel that these settings give you a nice combination of graphical quality and performance, and I've never really seen the need for Ultra in a lot of games unless they can run it really, really well. For example, in Rainbow Six Siege, here at 1080p Ultra we saw 251 frames per second followed by 1 and 0.1% lows of 177 and 75. Again, respectable results here, and your gameplay experience may vary depending on the map you are playing and whether or not you're playing an online or offline game. Again, footage here was taken from a lone wolf um, gameplay mode, but the actual figures were taken from the in-game benchmark test. But look, we can't get through this video without mentioning 
the Ryzen 5 3600. Now I know that, but I wanted to give the i5 some time in the limelight because it often goes overlooked. If we compare our i5 Cinebench render result to that of the Ryzen, then the Intel chip will fall behind as expected, but sometimes people forget that this doesn't make the weak chip bad, it's just not quite as good. I also run a few comparative, though arguably unrealistic gaming tests. The reason I say that is because I was using 2666MHz memory for the Ryzen CPU as well, and because faster speeds are usable with even cheap AM4 boards, it's likely that anyone building an AMD based system would take advantage of that fact. However, I still think using 2666MHz memory with the Ryzen is more likely and reasonable than buying a Z series board to use faster RAM with the 10400F, unless the 10400F is acting as a stopgap between upgrades. Just remember that both chips will perform differently with faster memory, and this may also alter the outcome of which one comes out on top. So should you buy the i5 10400F? Well, it can be found for cheaper than the standard 10400. Of course, it doesn't have integrated graphics, but I feel like if you're buying a chip like this, then you're not really going to be relying on those integrated graphics, so it doesn't matter too much. After all, its main competitor, the Ryzen 5, doesn't have integrated graphics either. I guess it comes down to whether or not this is available where you live and whether or not it's significantly cheaper than the Ryzen. If the Ryzen and the i5 were the same price where you live, I mean pretty much exactly the same price or just a tenner different either way, then I would have to say the Ryzen because it's the more well-rounded. But the i5 is still a great performer. If you want to get onto the Intel platform, you're pretty much adamant that you want Intel over AMD, then the Intel chip really is very good. Now I used to own an i5-8400 and then I had some time with a 9400 so I've had a lot of experience with these mid-range CPUs and I've always enjoyed my time with them and to be honest I would happily use this in my main system on a daily basis. I might start doing so in fact when it comes to testing games because it can do a little bit better. That being said, well I don't want to fall into my own trap there of uh, purchasing a Z series board just to make use of my faster memory. So yeah, I like the i5. I think it's a great way to get onto Intel's current platform. I don't know how long that platform will last, but it's a good mid-range chip. There are possibilities to upgrade to a faster i7, of course, or even an i9. And if you really want to, you can use faster memory, but only, I would say, if you plan on upgrading that CPU in a higher end motherboard a little later down the line. The i5 10400F then in conclusion, well, I like it, but let me know what you think. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like on it down below. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Let me know if you own this chip or whether you'd purchase this over the Ryzen. Let me know why in the comments and uh, I'll see you all in the next one.